are listening to WHOA Podcast, coming to you from Gainesville, Florida. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the WHOA GNV Podcast, the podcast bringing you businesses and individuals that make you go, whoa. I am your host, Colin Austin, and my co-host is Michael Dees. You really do stick to the script. <laughs> <laughs> it, it has like seven I, E's there. I, yeah, dude, well I, I did did well, right? Yeah, you did well. It feels good to get back into this. I was a little nervous at first with our recording last week, uh, getting back to a 60-minute form with no mute button, but it, it wasn't too bad. So, How many times do you like hit mute on yourself like when you're doing the Zoom podcast, when we're doing the yeah, coronavirus It's sessions? more like how many reasons do I hit the video? Because you've got dogs, you've got people, you've got birds, you've got, <laughs> birds. there's so many different things. Um, but I, I generally, I try to keep it muted until I know I'm gonna speak. I think that's what I've defaulted to now, but. There you go. There's no mute button here. If you guys you haven't checked out the little coronavirus sessions that we've done throughout this pandemic, uh, definitely go check it out every weekday. It's been going out every weekday at noon. Um, and we've done we've done a good handful. I mean, we did them every every day for what, for the last couple months. I mean, yeah. there's a lot there's a lot of them, and, but it's really kind of good information to kind of see how your other business owners and professionals have been navigating COVID-19. Um, so I hope everybody's doing well. Obviously, we want to do everything we can to help as many businesses get through this and save as many jobs as possible because it's definitely had an impact. Um, and yeah, so like before we get into today's episode, let me thank some incredible sponsors. You guys, I want to thank Student Made. You guys, Student Made has reopened for commercial and residential cleaning services, and they are ready to help. Uh, their team members have been certified by the Global Bio Risk Advisory Council to help prevent the spread of COVID-19. They have developed new procedures to keep you and their team members safe, including increased sanitizing of equipment, increased PPE for their team members, and extensive training to ensure that each person on their team knows how to disinfect and sanitize with their new products. To book a cleaning, give StudentMade a call at 352-672-0038 or visit them at studentmade.com. Again, that's 352-672-0038 or visit them at studentmade.com. Uh, much love to Kristen Hadid and her team for all that they do for Gainesville. Um, I keep seeing Kristen on the news. Yeah, she, was on, she was on Fox News. I see her in Simon Sinek's uh, LinkedIn feed all the time. <laughs> uh, so it's just really, really awesome to see uh, everything that's going on in their world and so Kristen thank you so much for your support and, and to the we had her on on one of the coronavirus we, sessions we did uh, we interviewed Kristen uh, <laughs> who <laughs> who I renamed if you guys didn't get this I renamed her Kristen Maid uh, on that episode so that was a coronavirus session <laughs> episode 20 and uh, definitely go definitely go check it out it was, uh, it was definitely worth listening to it was kind of like when all this coronavirus stuff was really starting to happen people were applying for the PPP um, and actually like one of the questions I kind of asked her was one of the questions that I asked in the Gainesville business owners private Facebook group. If you're not in that group, hit me up and I'll get you in there as well. But um, one of, but what I'd asked was like, you know, like would you, would you dive into your life savings to save your business? Um, you know, and that was, it was really, really interesting seeing some of the answers and, and then also hearing her answer. But I think, you know, this, this pandemic, this coronavirus, um, you know, just seeing, you know the a lot of the thoughts and a lot of the things coming up that I guess like maybe a lot of business owners don't really ever think about you know it's like all right would I dive into my life savings to save my business you know what what do I have to like do I have to lay somebody off when do I make that decision to lay somebody off those are things that I actually thought for the first time you know in my entrepreneurial career things that I thought I'd never have to do and so I don't know it's just really interesting we kind of dove into a lot of those topics so definitely check out her episode but anyway student made is here to help your business and help you get you clean up and and they're doing not only commercial but residential, so definitely, uh, definitely hit them up. And thank you, Student Made, for your support. We absolutely love you guys. Ready to get into the well show? Done. Yes, let's yeah, do man. it. Are you ready to get in the show? <laughs> <laughs> I'm always ready to get into the show. I just make sure I'm like, I'm like, I have all these highlighted parts. I'm like, man, I hope I don't like miss a highlighted part because then you know, like, Colin screwed something up. Yeah. Um, you guys, today on the show we have Paul Prusikowski, CEO of Opie Software and owner of Gainesville Prosthetics. Paul, 
Did hey, I say hey. your last name hey. right? Yeah, we're right on, man. <laughs> right on, Kellen. <laughs> the last names always get me, you guys. But, but you know, it's oh, like my second episode back into the studio. So, you know, hey. I had to get, get warmed up. Yeah. Was that good? Perfect. Solid? Right on. Right on. Solid, man. Right on. So, welcome to our show, man. Thank you so much for making the time and coming in and visiting with us. Sure. Uh, Glad to be here. You know, we like to really just kind of start by diving into into your story, man. Like, why like why are you doing what you do? And, and you know, why are you in Gainesville and all that kind of good stuff? So, kind of throw us way back, yeah, if I'll you go, will. Yeah, I'll go way back. Yeah. Way back. Please do. I will go back to high school. Okay. So yeah, starting in high school, uh, I had uh, an opportunity to, well, I had a couple little businesses. I was always an entrepreneur since I was a kid. And one of my businesses, uh, I was doing some light shows and pyrotechnics for high school bands. And uh, one of the kids that were in the band, his dad made prosthetics. So I was introduced to prosthetics at age 15, you know, because we get to hang out and we're like, hey, what's your dad do? You always ask those questions. And it's like, oh, my dad makes legs. I'm like, wait a second, I just built a guitar for a kid out of a butcher block. I bet you I can make a prosthesis. That's kind of cool, because it's science, it's, it's uh, hands-on, you get to play with your tools, uh, you know, make things, uh, help people, because I liked healthcare ideas. I was thinking, you know, doctor, engineer, what am I gonna be? And it was like this perfect blend. So I meet his dad and go visit him at his office and came back and told my mom, I'm gonna be a prosthetist. And she's like, what? What? I'm like, I'm like, this is what I'm gonna do. And, and, and uh, she took me to the library that night. Like, this is before the internet. This is 1985. And uh, we just went and found this, where the college curriculum guides were of like what colleges in the United States teach what careers. And we did a whole bunch of research on it. You know, and it was like, that was it. It was like, point chosen, stick with that point. Where was it? Like, where were you living? Uh, Buffalo, New York. Okay. Yeah, so I was up in right outside of Buffalo, and uh, yeah, that was the whole goal. Was just well, my goal then was to be a prosthetist. Okay, real quick, <laughs> I don't like. I hope I don't interrupt your story too much, but, no, like, just, but, but small chunks. You know, like what? I mean, was your mom always like that? I, I just had, you know, I'm thinking to myself, I'm like, man, if my kid like right now, if my kid told me that. <laughs> I'm like ashamed to even say. It. I'd be like, yeah, hey, whatever. <laughs> I'm like, sure, sure, son. You know, and I, and like I hate to even admit that because mm-hmm. like I, you know, I want to be support, but I, I just don't think I would have the same reaction of like, okay, like let's go to the library right now, like you know. Yeah, well, that, like, that was, was my mom. Like well, you that? know, let's 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 raise a glass. Yeah, uh, it's your mom. Her birthday Cheers. was just this week. She would have oh. been seventy five. Oh, right right she's Cheers. she's watching us right now, listening. Okay. So uh, yeah, she was like that. She was a teacher. And she was a teacher who would help the kids who were the last in the class become the first in the class. So she'd latch on to the smallest things. Whatever that was in a kid, like she could find that and she'd run with it. So, you know, if you expressed an interest in something, it wasn't lost on her. It was bam, you know, and just follow through and just let's go and then do the research and figure it out. And like, okay, now how are you going to get there? You know, that, that, was, that was just her. That's yeah, awesome. And she did that for so many people in her life and uh, you know it was good stuff so I'm glad she took me because you know it started the whole a whole direction I mean that that was the moment that like sparked all of this mm-hmm. okay so I mean <laughs> you were roughly how old yeah I was 15 15, 15 years old I can imagine there's a lot of 15 year olds growing up wanting to be a, what's the term? a, pr- yeah, a prosthetist? Pr- pr- prosthetist prosthetist you know Something making artificial limbs right. prosthetic limbs right. and orthopedic braces for people so yeah so uh, uh, we started that, and I think it was the next day. She, you know, they're already. My parents are like on the phone helping call these universities, New York University. I was supposed to go to NYU, and uh, that was you know the whole thing. So I'm gonna go to New York City. I'm gonna go to you know hang out there, get my degree from NYU, then come back to Buffalo and work here. And uh, yeah, so the folks that were running that that uh, program in NYU, you know, they're talking to a high school kid, helping you know get me th- you know through high school making sure I was taking the right classes, reading the right things, and you know, it was really, really pretty cool. Uh, six weeks before I was supposed to go to NYU, there was some funding issues that dried up, so they had to actually close the program down. Oh, no. Luckily, uh, I had a secondary application put into FIU at a school down, you know, Miami. Mm-hmm. And um, you know, it's all of a sudden, like, phew, like, I'm not going to New York, I'm going to Miami. And for a kid, small town outside of Buffalo, you know, Miami 
was, it might as well have been a whole different world. It was just so vastly Certainly warmer. Different. A lot warmer. <laughs> hey, I learned to love it like the first day I was there. <laughs> yeah. So uh, yeah, big, big shift. And uh, you know, eventually got there for school. And uh, it was the first week of school. I was just telling the story to somebody else. Another person I'd like to raise my glass to, my uh, director of the program who's no longer with us, but would have been sharing one of these glasses with us, Ron Spears. He, uh, he had met with me the week before the rest of the students came in. He was asking me about myself and what I'm interested in. And I was telling about, you know, I love computers. I was using all this stuff before there was the internet as we know it. It was all text-based stuff. And I'm telling him the sort of stuff I do just for fun. And he said to me in a Scottish accent, he, he <laughs> said, uh, Prozakowski, don't build these people another foot or knee. Bring computer technology into this profession. He says, if you do that, you got this. And that was the first week before I even cracked the first book in prosthetics. So another person who picked up on one little thing and said, this plus this equals 10 times that. You know, so that same kind of concept. It's like, you know, mentors and, and teachers, you know, people who see what's not there. They're just, you know, that was a, another big moment because that's what Opie, you know, the whole software piece. So it's go to school to become a, a, a prosthetist, yet, Immediately, you know, the first week I'm there, introduced to a bigger concept of. It was, you, it was don't build the the end game itself. Build the technology. Is that right? Or uh, no, it, it wasn't even specific on what type of software it would be. Okay, it was just computers. Like our field's craftsmen. You know, you learn. Most people learn from their dad. Yeah, you know, they were learning uh, the, the trade in the past. You know, it's just evolved to a science, and in, in the last 15, 20 years, it's been evolving. Uh, maybe a little bit longer than that, but it's it's before that it was really a hand skill. You learn how to make things, versus learning how to apply different techniques and science and clinical objective measures to improve patient care. Yeah, you know, that wasn't what we were 30 years ago. Yeah, you know, we were leg makers. Now we're part of this care team, and we do so much more. So he was saying, you just these people were not skilled in computers. So he said, you could be the leader here. It's a small field. You, know, you could lead this profession by bringing software and computer technology to this field. And however form you do, this is something that, that can change and revolutionize uh, a trade and help professionalize it. Okay, I mean, so did you dive in at that point with that in mind? You're just like, yes, like I'm gonna revolutionize this? Or you're like, ah, uh, okay. <laughs> no, yeah, I, I bit right on that. Yeah, you did. Yeah, you know, yeah, it's... Uh, yeah, I saw the power of connecting. Yeah, I was into be, you know bulletin board systems, and yeah, you know, I bought a computer with uh, paper root money when I was eleven. You know, so I was on modems when they were dial up at three hundred baud and nine hundred and eighteen hundred, and you know, all, you know, all those different things. I remember all that that evolution and connecting at a very early age uh, with people all over the world and communicating just through text only, but being in these these. Uh, you know, bulletin board systems and other stuff before AOL and everything came up. And I'm like, this is huge. There's so much power in connecting people and creating vehicles for, for communication and shared thought because collectively we're always better. You know, when you could find answers quick because you know how to navigate that back in that day versus going to a library and having to photocopy and look for the book that's not there. Yeah, so that's that was uh, you know, a lot of the dream was just how do we do that? And before I started OP, there were other projects I did that brought some of that connectivity to the field. Okay, what years were you in school at FIU? Uh, graduated in 92. So it was just two years, it was 90 through 92, I was down in Miami. Okay, so it sounds like that seed was planted, I mean, before you even, you said before you even really started class, right? So, mm -hmm. I mean, are you working on that? Like, or, you know, while going to this class, like to classes, like where was your mind, like where was your mindset at in college? Cause I see this a lot, like with entrepreneurs here in Gainesville and that kind of thing. They're like, oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go in on this. I'm gonna do this. And then it's almost like class is kind of like secondary. I mean, was that the case for you or were you really just diving into your education? Yeah, diving into the education. I had a bumper sticker. It said, go to school, learn the system, then change the system. Okay. And I wanted to be the best prosthetist I could be. You know, so I took that seriously. That was my, my primary job. That other stuff, it's like, hey, that's gonna come. I could add this to that, but I have to get really good at that first. 
you know, have to be really good at being a clinician and, and learn those skills. Okay, so was it, like when you were done with school in 92, I mean, was it right into your own thing? Were you still working on No, there like, were some, there job, some like, things. Um, actually, there's another mentor I want to speak to. He was supposed to be in town. I was supposed to be interviewing him today as well okay. to get his story. Uh, he's in the 80s now. Uh, the first year, I think it was maybe four or five months into my program, we went and did some clinical visits to you know, different practices in the Miami area. And I went to this, this one guy, Alan Finiston, and he had a clinic and uh, went in expecting to be like any other prosthetics facility I've been to in the past and expected to see all sorts of prosthetic technology. And then he, he so the clinic looked like every other clinic. And then he opened the back door. And in that back door, this guy had a, a place where he was had engineers and designers and they were building software. They were building computer, you know, CAD software. They're building the CAM robots to do the, the, the four axis carving. And he had uh, a whole nother area where he had created like robotic uh, automated production systems to pre, you know, produce in quantity certain things that are in a sense almost a commodity in our field. Yeah, but this guy took the concept of being a prosthetist orthodist to a whole nother level. And that was like, Boof, you know, for me, that was a big eye opener. It's like, Ron said you could do it. This guy did do it. And, you know, that was a, a big seat. So when I did graduate in 92, uh, I, I got to not use that as an opportunity to bounce around a little bit. Did some um, practice in Phoenix, did some practice in Southern Illinois, yet for different uh, internships and summer sessions. Then I went to Philadelphia, worked at the Shriners Hospital uh, for almost two years before uh, coming back down to Florida. There was an opportunity in 94 to get back down out of the cold at UF, at, at Shan. So they had a prosthetics department there. And same concept, you know, I went there uh, to just see patients and be a good clinician. Except uh, I think for about four or five months in, all of a sudden I just feel it started that itch that it's time to start something. HTML 1.0 was just published. <laughs> yeah, so the book was written. MySpace. <laughs> pre MySpace, pre MySpace. Geo Cities. This is like. The only HTML yeah. I know is MySpace. This is like Internet Explorer wasn't even there. You know, it was, it was uh, Mosaic, the free browser that you had to go to UF IT department. They give you a disk that had a browser on it. You know, and you get that disk, and you're like, I have a browser now. You know, and you can go to like a handful of websites and see, I'm like, this That's is where it all changes. And then that was the beginning. It's like immediately, you know, uh, wrote something down. I was actually considering pursuing a PhD. So I was at a fork in my road in March of 95, where I was uh, traveling to Australia to go to an international conference. And I was going to meet three of the professors from the three different universities that I could have gotten a PhD from doing a remote work at Shands UF and also do some travel at times to go get this PhD. But I just incorporated this dot-com company, you know, and I was struggling. I was talking about, you know, the, 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 I was accepted to all schools, like you are in if you want. But then I talked to these other, other older guys. I'm like, man, I got this great idea. You know, this, there's this internet thing. You know, I got this listserv I started that I'm passing out these flyers. It's like, and trying to get people to communicate through this email form. But I have a better idea. I think that this World Wide Web thing is going to change everything. I'm like, PhD or, or this, the Wild West? And you know, some of these guys were there like, Paul, you know the answer. I'm not going to tell you what the answer is. Just go home and do it. And that was it. You know, that was come back in March and just start building. Yeah, and we built ONP.com, which is, it was a portal back before there was Google's. You know, it was the portal where everything was. And built out the center of the orthotics and prosthetics universe online. Started the whole thing. Before there was an OP software. So, <laughs> Did you buy any stock in this internet thing? Or? <laughs> you know, I sometimes I wish I was born a dentist instead of a prosthetist, but bigger market. Right. But it, it, that, that no, it, I would never trade it in. <laughs> That's crazy, man. I mean, so what ended up? I mean, was it Shans that ended up getting you to Gainesville? Like, yeah. Where Where did that happen? Yeah, you know, Shans University. I was looking for an academic facility. Yeah, I want to go to a teaching. I could have worked in any private practice in the country, but I wasn't really interested in going to build somebody's business for them. What I really liked is working at the Shriners Hospital before I got lots of experience in a teaching environment. And I wanted to be a part of a teaching university 
where I'm seeing patients so I could do my patient care, but also have the academic resources uh, to pursue that PhD. Yeah, so that's why Shans was so awesome as an opportunity. It, it would have been a great place to do both. Uh, but instead, I, I was there five years, and I, I, just, I was working. I'd go home at 5 o'clock, then have a team of, of college students that I hired, and we'd work till 2 in the morning. And I'd get up in the morning and go back to work, and I was basically paying them out of my day job. And uh, you know, it was about five years into doing that, that it was just, okay, I got to do something. You know, start my own practice. Just I can't keep doing this because I'm, I'm having to ask for days off to go do my job. Yeah, you know, my real job started to become my night job. So that was the big, big thing. It took a lot of kind of, you know, guts to take the big leap. And, and what uh, year was that? Uh, that was right at the end of '98. Is when I left well, last quarter '98, and then in '99 I opened my own practice. So I just went full bore into the software piece, uh, building out that. And then at night, kind of building the practice up. Yeah, I wanted to give some space. Yeah, so after I left there, it was, I think you had to do things the right way. So when I left that job at, the, at uh, Shands, I didn't want my patients following me. Yeah, they had to reestablish themselves with the clinicians that were there. Yeah, you just, and then rebuild my practice the hard way from the ground up. Go build my referral sources. Go bring new clients in from, from number one. So, you know, that was a six-month intentional gap before I opened up my, my clinical practice. And then, you know, we just worked in that building. There was one little room, like a 10 by 10 foot room that I had developers packed in, like literally packed in. And when the patients would come in, we'd close that door and they'd all be in there quiet. And then when the patient would be gone, you know, okay, doors open and we could actually talk and stuff. <laughs> uh, but yeah, that was, that was the, um, you know, so those were the 99, 2000 era, you know, it was, it was just three or four people, you know. Uh, okay, so. So, where, so where is it at now, 2020? Yeah, we're we're at about a hundred people. Yeah, you know, we're, we're just you know we're just hovering in that high nineties, hundred people, and in, in uh, at, at OP, and and yeah, it's it's come a long way. Okay, so how do you generate the majority of your money, your oh, revenue? Uh, it's well, subscription. There's there's three different components to it. So yeah. you know, there's your initial one time sale, then there's your monthly subscription fees. You know, we're shifting to long-term contracts and you know, our users, they use this every day for their whole business. So they might have 10 people working in their office or 20. Everybody in that office uses our software. So there's licenses and then there's terms. And then we also have, this a transactional component too. So we integrated supply chain with clinical workflow. So our software, it's, it's basically a clinical workflow software. Everything from first phone call with the patient, intake, scheduling, fabrication management, ordering of your supplies, doing your clinical documentation, billing Medicare, getting paid, you know, everything that has to do with running a business doesn't make legs. That's, that's not my software. It runs the business, helps you run the business. The supply chain, we have integration with our supply chain. So when you're seeing patients, one of the things that used to suck is you'd see your patients and you'd see eight patients in a day and then you had to go buy all of the parts that you needed to assemble a prosthesis for them. Because you don't make everything. There's certain things you do make, but you have to get this piece and that piece. So you'd have all these catalogs and you'd be there trying to race the clock because these people would be on the phone. You gotta catch them before the phone, before they start taking orders. So you're scrambling, getting all your parts lists in and ordering. And we automated that. I said, one of these days, we only won't have a catalog. You know, we're gonna e-commerceize this stuff. So we started building e-commerce sites, but then when we integrated them with the software, where the decision on where I'm gonna order the part from, configure the part, document the part, that we made that part of the workflow. Like right when the clinician needs to do it, they can do it. And that changed everything. And that creates a component of our revenues as a passive revenue stream that you know, we've created value for everybody in that process. And that, that's been a big changer too. So it's a nice balance. Okay, explain to me like which, and maybe I'm just not following here, like which really came first? I mean, it sounds like the prosthetics side, you were diving into that, and then the software side kind of evolved because you just saw this need? Yeah, yeah, so I didn't even get into how I started doing it. Okay. Yeah, yeah, so when I started on the practice in 99, before I even had my first patient, we, we wired the entire place with the network. You know, unheard of back then, you know, yeah. people weren't, private practices weren't doing it. I put a monitor and a little video camera and a computer in every single patient room. 
and we had you know, we just and we when we launched the practice and had the grand opening we told people we're creating an electronic medical record system we're going to have information the clinician the patient and the computer are going to be all operating together in this in this environment and, and you know for private practice even my physician friends didn't have access to that yeah you know, it was big when my friends in in uh, Hale got their computer systems in you know, a couple of years later and then we were building to it so when the, I had the practice going and the, the software company that was a portal was also building this application. I went through four different versions of it before we created the, the one that people are actually using today. It was a lot of prototyping. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it was, it was sort of a, it's a synergy. You know, the two aren't, it's not one or the other. It's, it's they're, they're together in, in very many ways. It just sounds to me like you were kind of a step ahead of everybody. Yeah, I mean, yeah. is that fair to say? No, no, it's fair to say. Yeah, they're sort of reading the tea leaves. So my my question is like, how, like, like why, like, how do you, and, and maybe it's because, like, here I am as an entrepreneur. I just want to know how I can be a step ahead, <laughs> right? Like, I'm like, I, you know, I always kind of credited Justin, my ex business partner, uh, with this. Like, he had a knack for being able to tell like which products coming mm-hmm. out of China, like we were selling ATVs and dirt bike, like a lot of motor, like he always had a knack for kind of knowing what was about to be hot, mm-hmm. you know? And and I've always admired people, because I always feel like that's a trait that I haven't really ever had. I've never been really able to like kind of gauge where things are going. Mm-hmm. I, I've always been like, I've, I've, always, I've been really good at being able to respond to the environment around me. You know, this, this COVID-19, this pandemic, for example, as, as a, you know, as soon as this stuff started happening, I would say a, a week before everybody else, I was like, I, I know exactly what we're doing. Hey team, line up. This is what we're gonna do. This is mm-hmm. what we're gonna, like, in the moment, I'm able to execute and, and really adapt to the situation. But I've always admired people who can kind of foresee what's about to happen, you know, and be a step ahead. Yeah, you know, like, yeah. Is that just is that just a natural trait that you have, or like, or is there a way to cultivate that? I think there's ways of cultivating it. I was just sharing with somebody some ideas on how to do that. <clears throat> I, I uh, to go to the edge of the universe, you know, to see what no one sees and then bring it back. You know, to literally free yourself from what you're doing to think as far ahead as you possibly can, as to what would the ultimate world look like, what would the ideal situation look like, and you know, for me being a clinician owning a business and knowing a lot of people who were clinicians who owned businesses, I knew the pain and suffering they had of like just just inefficiency because stuff was everywhere. Piles of paper, looking for a chart, looking for this. And whoever had it, had it. You couldn't share a paper folder. These things would get lost. And being a computer kid since you know age 10 or 11 and being in my 20s, it's like, it was natural. This is like exactly what it needs. Like, what would it look like? How would it work? And how's it going to work in a way that I could use it? My peers who aren't computer people will use it. So yeah, I, I do that with you know, a lot of different things. Just go to the edge and see what's there and think from the customer's perspective. What do they really need that they don't need or they don't know they need yet? What do they really need that, that they don't even know exists yet? And then spending some time there. But you've, you've got to make space for that, though. If you don't make the space to, you know, call it a vision quest, you know, go on that vision quest and try to create the next version of reality and then come back and keep filling in the blanks that you don't know right away. Yeah. It makes me think of that uh, Ford quote where it's like, if you would have asked the people what they wanted or needed, they would have told you a faster horse, <laughs> you know, and when it was developing that, it makes me think of that, you know, it's like, I don't know, it's good. What you got, Mike? Um, you, you talked about uh, revenue streams and, and licensing specifically, and, and I'm curious, in my limited understanding of software, usually when you're talking about licensing, you're talking about like an on-site server-based technology. Have you mi- migrated systems over to cloud yet, and what has that transition been like? Oh, the transition's been, like, uh, compared to driving downhill in an 18-wheeler. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to change the tires and also trying to put wings on it because the cliff is down at the bottom and you've got to jump and you've got to become an airplane. So you're changing tires while you're moving and assembling wings to, to fly. So we have been... Oh, that sounds successful. Right. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's a trip. Uh, so, you know, so we got all these users who are using it and we're not going to build another version. We're going to migrate them from what they're using now into the next generation of the software. And we've been doing that, but you know, re-engineering, 
processes and, and uh, re-engineering the, the tools. So there's portions of our software now that are truly cloud-based. So we still have uh, less than 50% of our users are using our on-premise version. And the other 50% are in this hybrid space that it's not completely browser, 100% browser. Mm-hmm. It's, just, it's a portion thereof. And you know, we're just rebuilding the most critical pieces first to ultimately come up with uh, you know the complete browser solution, but it, it, the the fun is going to the edge of the universe on those pieces too. Don't just lift and shift. We're not just going to rebuild the experience that we had before into the cloud. We're going to reimagine. You know, what did we learn from 15 years of serving these customers? What did we learn sucked about our software? What did I hate about using the software that, that we created? You know, where where's the friction and pain? And then bringing that into the blueprints for the next iteration. So do you have a whole process in terms of how you're how you're laying that out to the customers when when you want them to be 75 percent when, when they're 100 percent on the cloud? I mean, you have it laid out from a timeline standpoint or is it still tinkering, you know, trying to get them there? Oh, well, it's still getting there. You know, we have uh, we have to get to the point where we have the tipping point of value. Yeah, we, what we've done first is we recreated a component that was already available through a uh, app. You know, so we, we want to sunset our iOS and Android app, which allowed clinicians to do certain things in that kind of cloud environment using apps. We needed to ditch that because it's just overly complicated nowadays <clears throat> to try to keep multiple programs and then create the single source of that. So we reproduced that in our, in our cloud component. So a lot of people who are already using that, you know, jumped right in. You know, they have to shift to a hosted solution. They can't be on prem. They have to be in our hosted space to be able to get access to that. But I still don't personally feel that that's pushed us. It's not the value prop yet. You know, we've got to get to that tipping point where th- this this next phase, this next six months, is when we're focusing on the the points where the pain exists almost the most for the clinician. And how do we re-engineer the, you know, the way that the clinician and the patient interact? And, and that's, that's the great challenge. So I, th- I think when we achieve that, that's when folks, we don't have to convince them anymore that this is what's for you. Let me just show you what we had and let me show you what we made with 15 years of experience of working within our own constraints. And it's gonna be light, night and day. Hmm. There's a lot of pain points for me, and the reason I asked it, it might seem like a specific question, is that like our point of sale mm-hmm. um, that we've had since 2011 has been uh, an on-premise version, and everything has shifted to the cloud. But the problem is, it's not a it's not a niche um, software that's geared to scooter dealerships. Mm-hmm. It's it's uh, full full blown retail, and so the changes that they've made. Um, don't really adapt to us as well as they probably do these other industries, and it's been a huge pain point. Mm-hmm. Um, and and so there so there's resistance to change. I mean, we're uh, I think it was gosh I don't know it's 2020 now maybe it was in 2018 that that I had to renew um, our our license for mm-hmm. it, and they're like you can't keep doing this. It's phasing out, bud. And I'm like, well, you you got to show me how to mic because we have you know, 10 years of customer database that we need to have transferred in and there's just no migration for it. Yeah, we have to migrate the patient data. <clears throat> but that's that's a critical piece because people, we've been telling the data story for years. Yeah, that's been my torch. It's like, guys, big data. You know, this isn't just about the numbers. This is about you've got gold is not just in getting paid by Medicare. It's in having a ton of information about your business, your operations, so you can improve and you can learn and you can talk about to your community of referrals what you do in mass, like this is the, you know, this is the patient satisfaction we get by taking care of this type of population of patients that you send to us. We can show you we're better, but you need data to do that. So we can't throw that away. We've got to migrate. And that's why, you know, you could probably rebuild a software from zero to full bore a lot faster if you told people you can't migrate. You're just going to have to jump into a new product. Mm-hmm. But that would be a disservice to the entire community we serve. And, and you know, these are friends, peers, my profession, you know, so we're, we're taking that whole thing up with us and it's a long, hard journey and it is painful. 
for sure. I got uh, but it, but you know, it's nothing's worth it if it's too easy, right? Yeah. yeah, of course. I got. I have some specific questions on on the prosthetics themselves. Um, if you can humor me on them, because I'm I'm just curious. Mm-hmm. Um, in most of what what you've dealt with, um, is it is it human only? Does you get into animal? Is it external only? Do you get into internals? I only do external. Okay. And only human. Okay. Um, so the what what I think of as the quintessential um, story came out of 2012. Now he's become famous for many other, other reasons. reasons, right? Um, but but the Blade Runner Oscar mm-hmm. Pistorius in 2012 was the first uh, you know prosthetic patient to be able to participate in the Olympics. Um, what what was that like from somebody inside the profession to to witness that? Um, and then I'm I'm curious if you can shed any kind of light on what kind of process goes into uh, you know making a functional prosthetic uh, prosthesis for for an everyday human, everyday walk of life versus something engineered towards competition. Yeah, great. So, you know, that was really big. We followed that closely when he was trying to get in and get accepted. And that was, you know, our whole profession was cheering that on. Uh, I had uh, the great opportunity to participate in the Paralympic uh, movement uh, with a a guy from Gainesville, Albert Reed. He was a, a Buholtz graduate. And he had a scholarship to go play in Tennessee. Uh, football, and it was like the first week of practice, got in a car accident and lost his leg above the knee and came back. And I was only 26 when I met him. Yeah, he was one of my first patients that really pushed me beyond my own skills uh, at that time, just really, really drove. Uh, this guy was a high performer. Yeah, he was a star quarterback. And all of a sudden, his, his, everything's gone, the education, the opportunity. And... Um, you know, I told him, you know, the, the, the Olympics are in Atlanta this year. You know, let's go. There's this thing called the Paralympics. And it's, you know, this is high performance. These people are like bleeding edge athletes that work twice as hard as able-bodied folks to get to where they're at. You need to see this. <clears throat> and we did. You know, so he went and we got to work. So he, we, he went to Australia, p- competed in, in, in the Paralympics there after being inspired at uh, the Atlanta, you know, literally he came home and just started to learn how to hobble, learn how to learn how to trot, you know. Actually, at that event, he learned how to run from the guy who owned the company, the inventor of that blade foot, the flex foot. You know, he was sprinting down the hallway for the first time from his little hop, skip, jump that he had to running down the hallway with this guy who was also an amputee who was the inventor. And that was just the beginning. It was like within nine months later, he's coming home with uh, you know, awards as, as being one of the fastest above the knee amputees in the United States. So you know, that's a Gainesville, Gainesville story. But you know, the difference of the prosthesis, I, I would tell people, it's not the prosthesis, it's the person who wears it. I can make the same exact prosthesis for two people. And yeah, it's, it's the person who puts it on. It's the mindset they're gonna have. Yeah, there's a lot more work when you're working with a high performance athlete than with somebody who's just a day-to-day individual, uh, because the high performance athletes have a, a lot of needs. A, they break things all the time, you know, because they're going to push the envelope of the technology. So it has to be robust, but it has to be lightweight. It has to be perfectly aligned. You guys know alignment. Bad alignment ruins bearings. Well, we blew a lot of bearings and hydraulic units and knees. Uh, from his training, you know, and, and one degree off can change the whole game and you've got to get in there and, and get it in. So it's, it's a lot of hard work when you're working with the high performance folks because that, that is perfection, you know, that alignment, they, and it's not just the prosthesis, it's their body. You know, they have to fine tune their movement because you have to determine is it their muscles that aren't perfectly in control yet or is it something I could do with a wrench? And you could chase that back and forth. You're always adjusting and you find out, no, it's their hip rotators. You know, they need to stabilize this gluteus medius a little bit more. They need to do something so that they've got perfect control of that hip movement in order for me to get in and do that fine tuning at the knee. So how many voices are at that table to create something like that? And then I'm also curious, like what's the what's the risk the insurance policy you're 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 creating a a prosthesis for a a world-class sprinter Mm -hmm. and he suffers a blowout and and what kind of injury are you facing and and what's what's the fallout there 
you know, those are questions we never asked. <laughs> <laughs> great you know, because you know, back in the day, I don't think that was that important. You know, you're all on the edge. You know, and I, we were at some races where some legs blew out. Yeah, you know, I've I, we watched. You know, literally the things crack right in the middle of a 200 meter. You know, not with Albert. We, we've had our moments where things you know fail, uh, but these things happen. You know what? These kids brush it off, and I'm going to sue the process. Like, I need more glue. <laughs> you know, I need, I need stronger <laughs> glue. Let's go and fix it. You know, and and get up and go again. Yeah. So, yeah, I don't think. Yeah, liability just wasn't. We were just in it together, you know. And you're both pushing the envelope. Yeah, the, the athlete and the prosthetist who's going to work with them. And it's it's a trust relationship. Do you just get like amped off that? Like these type of relationships where it, you're so. It seems like you're so invested into like the success of that athlete, for example. I mean, is that just? Oh yeah, no. That that's that's the stickiness of this profession. Yeah. is that you have a personal relationship with every one of those folks that you treat because you're not selling them a product that they say, thank you, maybe I'll come service it every once in a while. You are involved from some of these people before they even had their amputation or the day they wake up and you meet them and, and you you have a relationship with them. You, you show them that there's hope and then you say, trust me, I will help you achieve your dreams. What are they? Do you want to run? Do you want to walk? to school again? Do you want to dance? Do you want to walk down your daughter's aisle with her? What is it you want to do? Let's get you there. And, and those relationships are why people just, you, you, you just stick to this. You know, it's, 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 you don't, people don't leave this, this profession to hop. There are magic moments. And I'll tell you that the, 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 the most powerful day that will never ever get old is the day uh, somebody puts their prosthesis on for the first time and takes their first steps. You know, we've cried, you know, so many times you're in that room and you're just like tears of joy with whole families because people just, it's like, it's the day, you know, and they go through such a low to get to such a high. And that's still just the beginning because now you got to learn. Yeah. Th those next steps are, are, are challenging and difficult, but yeah, you know, those relationships, man, you know, that's, I can't even describe fully in words. How do you instill that purpose into the team? Like... I think it's one thing to be there and to experience that and to see those reactions in the family. But how, like, you know, the people who are a little bit more behind the scenes, mm -hmm. they don't necessarily get to see that firsthand. Like, what ways are you communicating and instilling that that purpose? Because that seems like such an awesome purpose, right? Yeah, behind, yeah. Behind what you do. Well, it's, so. it's, it's enabling people. You know, it's, it's giving people a life back, you know. And, and um, in the software company, I, I let people know, it's like, you know, our patients are those customers. Because you are helping that customer do better every single day so they can help more of those patients. In our buildings, it's a shared building, so the clinic is downstairs and OP Software is upstairs. Whenever they go to lunch, you know, people see the patients rolling in, they see the patients walking out. You know, I say, just keep your eyes open. Look and see you know, the, the good work that comes out of this building. And, and you're part of that. You're, you're all part of it, no matter what you do, support, code, IT support for infrastructure, whatever it is, you are enabling someone to help another human being, and that you know that's that's the you know the, the, the stories are right there to see. When you were talking about like the mindset of those who are actually like getting the prosthetic, right? Um, you know, do you see more of the? Do you see more of the hope and the inspirational side, or is it, you know, if you had to put it on a scale, like, is it is it more of that, or is it more of like, man, my like, I can't believe that I'm in this situation or this happened to me, or like, is it more negative? Like, what do you, what do you, you know? Like it's a, you it's see? a mix. You know, it's it's definitely a mix. I I, th I think you know people are educated a lot more today about the scenario because of the internet. You know, they have resources to learn about it. So it's not as hopeless in the beginning because their family did research. They looked and they could see the inspirational stories. And, you know, it was like all of a sudden amputees are everywhere in the last 10 years. You know, they're just on television shows and the commercials and the feel good, uh, you know, things that are out there. So people see that, that it's not the end, it's the beginning. So I, yeah, I'd see a lot more folks that were optimistic uh, but it's still a very hard journey. 
you know, the, the, from the moment of loss through whatever normal is going to be for you, it's trials and tribulations. And, uh, you know, we're coaches, we're psychologists and we're not trained to do that, but that's what we are cheerleaders. And you're going to, and it drives us crazy because you're trying to make something perfect for an imperfect world. The body changes, your pants fit differently throughout the month. Imagine something that has to hold on to you and you got to stand on and walk on every single day. So we're trying to make something for a dynamic individual. And that's, and, and you know, as you're going through that, you know, you, you're going, you're dealing with their emotions as well. And you're, you're trying to hold it all together, literally. And it's a, uh, it's a very interesting relationship, technical, personal, professional, and, um, how is it on like you though? I mean, is it does it become draining when you're when you have that hope and you're excited to help somebody and and then maybe they're not so much? You know, it can be, and I, I think some of those folks that don't take responsibility for themselves, it's a little bit of a you know a little of a bummer. Yeah, you know, that you know this person can do it, and they're not ready to give it their all. But what I've seen is some of these people just need time, you know, and, and they come around. You know, not everybody is ready to say, hey, I wanna run again. You know, there's a lot of work yet to do personally to be prepared for re-entering after some of the, after these losses. It's, it's, it's your body, it's just got yeah. taken apart. From a from a team standpoint, we were talking about you know how do you how do you get that message to them? Is that is a human component? Is it seeing seeing the struggles of you know a potential client? Is is that part necessary, or are there team members that are motivated strictly by the scientific advancement? Um, they're doing it for the science because it's cool. I mean, you talked about the first time you mm -hmm. got to play and make with the tools. Like it wasn't maybe about like helping somebody. It was just about the cool science stuff. Yeah, you know, there's a there's a variety. The nice thing about our field is there's space for everybody with any desire. Yeah, if you're really into the <clears throat> compassion, empathy, healing, arts, you're really into that. And then some people are really into the, the, the technical piece, really geeked out about the new advances. And that's, that's their focus. Hey, you know, check out this new this, this new that. Like with arm prostheses, you know, those things, you know, they're so advanced. And all these different robotic hands and fingers that can do all these things. So there's a space for just about everyone. Not everybody is the same. Uh, so, you know, clinicians are very. Which are you? Uh, definitely more into the patient side. Yeah, I've never been, even though I'm a tech guy, I don't overemphasize the technology. Because people think, hey, if I have a really fancy sports car, I can drive better or something, right? Well, if I have a really expensive leg, I'm going to be better. I'm like, no, no, no. Simple is really a better solution for you know, the majority of the cases. So it's good to know about it all and be able to use it, but not push it and get geeked out about that. It's really about seeing people achieve their goals and not let the technology be the crutch because it is the human that has to put that prosthesis on or the brace on and overcome you know, what's in here, not what's missing down there. I'm sitting here drawing parallels and it's not to say that's the exact same thing. Um but we're recording this on May 26th, and tomorrow SpaceX is doing its first launch of uh, a crewed a crewed mission on the rocket. And you're talking about um, you know everybody being in it when when you're watching say Oscar Pistorius or anybody mm -hmm. that's that's doing that. And I remember when the space industry first got privatized and SpaceX first came on the scene. Uh, how people crying if a rocket exploded, or, or how how emotionally involved they were with mm -hmm. every single step of the way, and I imagine that's going to change tomorrow whenever there's actually people involved. Um, so like I said, you, you're sitting there telling those stories and I'm just thinking of those parallels where some people might be motivated by the science because it's you know going back to score, square one in a lot of ways for, mm -hmm. for you know rocket science. Um, but like I said, when you put people people on it, it's a different story. Yeah, yeah, it's a whole, whole different game. Yeah. So I think that's interesting. And you know, it's all about people in this field. Let me uh, shift gears a little bit as we head towards wrapping up. Um, you're somebody who's very invested into the Gainesville entrepreneurial scene. 
Um, thank you for buying our shirts, by the way. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> He's already got, got his hashtag GNVBIZ uh, we, we shirt. Te- we texted before and said, hey, we have GNVBIZ like, shirt. Yeah, yeah. Let's, <laughs> let's make sure we match on the podcast. We, we left um, you out of the group chat. <laughs> uh, you know what do you, what do you feel Gainesville's missing? Like where where can we improve as a, you know as a hub for small business as a hub for entrepreneurship? Um, what do you feel like we're missing? It's hard to say miss. I don't see things lack. Okay. Yeah, I, th- I think where can we improve? Yeah, like where's our potential? Yeah, I I think um, you continued greater collaborative uh, sessions, whatever those look like now. You know, just sharing, and I think, you know, if Gainesville focuses on ourselves, you know, just, just you know, when I, when I think about new innovation and, and, and mentoring some of the young businesses, it, it's, you know, how can those of us who have been there, done that, share more? You know, what more can we give? in small chunks to the young startup individuals who can be multipliers of that. Yeah, you know, can we accelerate without an accelerator? You know, by taking opportunities when you see somebody that you can relate with and just give them some really strong guidance. Uh, so, you know, more of that. You know, if more business owners took the role of mentor on in whatever capacity and, and committed to it, you know, it's, it's like you just put a lot of energy in one person. Try not to solve all the world's problems of every single business in Gainesville. Just pick a small handful of them and say, you know, these three, I'm going to coach and I'm going to be their accountability buddy and I'll be a listener. And I think there's a lot of opportunity for a lot more people to engage in that. Uh, serious, seasoned business folks and take a little bit of our own time and giving it back. Uh, and, and growing, growing, growing the community that way. So, so internal focus from our business owners and uh, individual mentorship versus uh, just getting in front of a group and speaking. Yeah, those are the, those are light lifts. The challenge is being on the other end of the phone for uh, a couple young folks who are dealing with the uncertainty of starting up and trying to make it through and. What's my, is my idea the right idea? Am I going the right direction? What should I do now? Yeah, and, and being there for them. Okay, so what would your advice be to the young founders that are listening to this that are looking for that mentorship? Because I think a lot of the times it's just like, man, like I don't know how to find the right mentor. I mean, really mm-hmm. reflecting back on your story, it sounds like you had a lot of great natural mentorship where it was, whether it was from your mom or from, you know, a a professor, somebody saying like, hey, like (laughs) go this route. I mean, Mm -hmm. it's not like you had that early on. I mean, but but what about for the the people where it's not so natural or they they need, they want to reach out to somebody and look, you know, and get a mentor? How how should somebody go about getting a mentor? Yeah, I think, you know, one of the things people could do is don't just go to the tech events yeah, because we have a small pool of people that seem to be you know, consistently at these events. Yeah, branch out a little bit, look at other business opportunities that are going on where other people are speaking that might be a little bit different than what you're doing, but other business folks and just expose yourself to different people and then start talking to them. Yeah, begin that relationship, begin the communication and ask and, and just find, there's, everybody has something they could teach you. And you know, the, the, when they say the student, when the student is ready, the master shall appear. Well, be ready, and then put yourself out there to be in places where you might happen to hear somebody speak or run into somebody. So you have to get social. You have to go out to again more than just the tech networking events, but other business community events. And if you see somebody that inspires you, ask them. Ask if you can take them to lunch. Ask them a few questions. And, and you know then and. and it could be somebody who teaches you some skills. You know, just perseverance in in business is uh, something that so many successful business people can share their stories of trials and tribulations, even if it's in a different sector. So, you know, there's certain parts of business that transfer outside of your sector. So, that would be some advice to try to break into that. Cool. I got one more. Um, 
for somebody that's known what they wanted to do since they were 15, <laughs> I have to ask, what would you be doing right now if not this? Well, I reinvent myself probably every five years, <clears throat> number one. Yeah, so, but I include whatever I brought to the table last. So right now, really, you know, big interest is in... Uh, some additional projects, you know, going outside. I spent 35 years focusing on two letters of the alphabet, O and P. Okay, so love it. It's been my whole life. I'm going to continue to push there. But you know, looking at other areas to explore. Uh, really fascinated in the broadcast space. My dad was a television engineer, so, and he, he's still here. But let's raise a glass to him. <laughs> Cheers, Dad. We haven't done it in a while, so. <laughs> so, uh, so you know, I grew up in broadcast and television. And uh, my wife's an instructional designer and into creating all sorts of instructional media. And, um, you know, we've been just co-creating you know, delivery mechanisms and, you know, how do we take a stream and make it really cool? You know, so, but the cool thing is those projects that I'm working on also benefit all my other businesses. You know, so they synergize. It's like, so this Bamboo Strategic Media is a project I've been working on for about five years, along with my wife, Kara. And uh, yeah, it's becoming a playground for building ideas out in, helping other people build their ideas in our playground so that we can get better at the arts that we're using now to then be able to use those tools for internal, you know, my own businesses. Uh, but focusing on other people's projects first. And, you know, that's something I love doing. You know, ultimately, you know, helping other entrepreneurs grow and thinking through ideas with them and in this case, helping them create uh, the digital reality that they want with today's tools, which, you know, there's no limits. You know, it's the imagination. How far can we take it? Do you disconnect or are you always engaged? I am pretty much always engaged. It's, it's a full-time thing. Yeah. Uh, I kind of got that vibe. <laughs> so, yeah, it's, it's just on. That's good, though. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm very much the same way. You are, I mean, yeah. Shannon, even this weekend, three day week, I actually did a really good job. I mean, like Mike said, we we're recording on the 26th. I know this goes out on June 8th, but uh, you know, it's Memorial, the more Memorial Day weekend. I definitely just got dis- some R and R a little bit. Yeah, or I mean, just had some fun disconnecting for three days was like super tough for me. No, it's tough, man. It's really, really tough. Yeah, you know, so um, with kind of throwing it back to Gainesville. I mean, selfishly, like, what's your business need from Gainesville? Uh, leadership development for team level managers, you know, so uh, really good at, at the, you know, the executive resources are always available. Yeah, I think we're doing a really good job with resources for that. But folks who have to manage a team of five people for the first time in their lives, mm. you know, so, you know, this isn't about starting your business and this isn't the stuff that, you know, Hey, here's how you start and run a business. It's how do you manage five individuals that were your peers six months ago and now you're a manager. So tough. So tough. Yeah, it's huge. And just skills development in that space, you know, where there's workshops and, you know, some sort of engaging opportunity, not just a PowerPoint lecture, but, you know, role playing type stuff. If, if, if someone could create that product, that service, I think it would serve a lot of businesses that are in that growth stage that have got beyond where everybody connects telepathically and you actually have to have different tiers of management. Uh, so, you know, that's an area where, where, you know, finding resources locally would be great. So, so let me ask, do you believe that level of leadership, do you believe that's something that, that can be taught or does it have to be innate and honed? Uh, 50-50. You know, you're going to either have this, the raw, you know, tools that can be honed or you can be taught methodology that at least if you repeat it enough, you'll begin to look like what you just did. You know, so practice through process versus make it up as you go. Yeah. And, um, yeah, I think if you inherently find individuals that have those raw tools, this, this skills great but that's not the way the world works mm-hmm. you got 100 people 
in your business and you're gonna you create managers from within and you gotta you work with what you got could be a really skilled person in their specific space but management that's a different thing but you give them opportunities it's definitely something that's come up a lot uh, here. It's one of my favorite topics because in, in my own journey, it's been one of the toughest things is going from that peer, you know, you get done get done with the day's work, go grab a beer after, and then you're not being invited anymore because you're their leader. You can't hold them accountable um, because, you know, you used to call them a friend. Um, it's It's been one of the hardest things in my own journey. Um, so I'm, I'm always excited to get input on that and talk about that kind of topic. Yeah, I think sometimes leadership can be a lonely place, you know, because you're in a spot where you're seen differently, you know, and it's just, you just, it's part of it. You know, you just, we figure it out and we have peer groups and we have other leaders we talk to. And that's, that's, I think a big piece of uh, the survival Mm -hmm. mechanisms we use is, is, you know, those peer groups, like just this, you know, hanging out with other people that are running and, making and shaking things you know you, you need you need those peers yeah it's so tough i was listening i was listening to a podcast where this guy um it was one of dave ramsey podcasts but like he this guy like went into an executive leadership role for the first time and then this pandemic hit and he was forced to lay off 200 people oh my god and he was talking about like the emotional toll mm-hmm. that it had on him like it's, it's I can't even I can't even imagine that. Like I'm yeah. sitting here thinking about the times it's like I used to walk into to the showroom and people would say, "Hey, what do you think about the game last night?" And now I like I walk in the room and you know they they scatter. It's, it's like silence. <laughs> not even close. I, yeah, it's not even close. So just remember that <laughs> right <laughs> that people have stepped into executive roles and then have been forced to like lay off, lay off 200, 200 people, people, and then maybe that'll make you feel a little bit maybe. better about your situation, maybe. everybody. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll shut up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but man, yeah, like I couldn't imagine. I mean, I heard this guy talking, I just my heart went out to him That's I was like man wild. it's wild um, this has been awesome this has been so much fun man thank you so much for coming yeah, well, on thank you guys yeah I mean for this is fun yeah it's, it's super interesting I was just like captivated by everything you're saying and like we went to so many different areas too which is really cool um, so I mean for our audience like can, like can they connect with you how should they connect yeah with absolutely you? so you know all you on LinkedIn or yeah, something yeah LinkedIn like, you know LinkedIn's my my best professional way to reach out to me okay, and connect with that. Uh, Facebook pages for Gainesville Prosthetics, OP Software, Bamboo Strategic Media. Yeah, it's sparsely populated, but you know, those are ways you could see and learn a little bit more about the businesses and see some of the projects we're working on. Uh, but definitely LinkedIn. You know, just look up, look me up in, in the LinkedIn. Easy cool. to find. Awesome, man. Well, thanks thanks again so much for coming on. This is great. And, uh, uh, yeah, and I, you know, my... Connect with me there, and uh, yeah, if you want to chat, send me a message. You know, I I talk to anybody who would like to. You know, I'm very accessible to anybody who wants to chat. And that, so. That's what's so great about you know a lot of the Gainesville entrepreneurs, man. It's just like, you, you, I mean, I think kind of going back to our talk on mentorship a little bit. Like that's that's step one. Like don't be afraid to reach out and and talk to somebody. I mean, and like you said, like even inviting somebody out to lunch, the number of times somebody has invited me out to lunch and I've said yes, it's probably like 90% of the time I'm saying yes. And if the, the 10% is usually because of some sort of conflict or something else, I'm like, oh, let's do it some other time, you know? So we're just, I, I love to see how accessible the leadership and the entrepreneurs in Gainesville are. So definitely, uh, definitely do that, so. In it together. Yeah, absolutely. Any final words, Mike? I think I covered everything. I really wanted to get into some of that uh, sports stuff, so that was excited to hear that. But I think we pretty well covered most of my scribbles here. <laughs> awesome. Well, um, you guys, please continue to support our podcast. Share this with somebody. Share this episode with somebody. Leave us a review. That's definitely one of the best ways you can, uh, you know, support us. Um, Buy a shirt like these. Buy, buy a shirt, yep, you know. Yep, easy, just guys, easy. Just rocking, uh, rocking the swag. You can buy that on our at our shop on whoagnv.com. And um, that's it, world. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you for your support. This is the WHOA GNV podcast. The podcast bringing you businesses and individuals that make you go whoa. whoa. We will see you later. Bye.